All right, everybody. Hi, uh, welcome to the 12th Board Candidate Forum hosted by League of Women Voters of Chicago. My name is Jane Ruby and I am president of the League of Women Voters of Chicago. Thank you to all who are joining us. Um, thank you to the can to candidates who are joining us and this will be recorded and you know, uh, other people in anticipation of election day will also be able to view it. Before we get started, just a quick blurb about our organization. The League of Women Voters of Chicago is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and to ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy and education. Through this forum, we hope we all become better informed about the issues facing our communities and become better acquainted with the candidates running for office. So in the chat, I'm going to put some links um, about our organization, about other candidate forums that we've done um, across the city, and the link of where this re recording will live after the um, after it's after it's over, and some you know key helpful dates um, around the election, and also a link to our Illinois Voter Guide, which is a great guide for. Um, voters as well. And since we are doing this virtually instead of in person, I will also be including the links to our two candidates' websites in lieu of them being able to pass out um, literature at an in-person event so you can learn more about both candidates. And with that, um, I guess we will go ahead and get started and I'll turn it over to Catherine Mardikes, our moderator. Thank you. Let me just get um, us set up very quickly here uh, so that we can, uh, let's see, add spotlight. I'm gonna see if we can't get this set up. It's gonna look like a stage a little bit. Oh, I think I'm next. And where's Melanie? There she is. Melanie is our timekeeper today. Um, okay, so this is what we'll have going for us today. Um, so let me talk a little bit now about um, the um, the audience questions. We're going to start, uh, we're gonna have questions throughout. Uh, that we've prepared. A lot of them are going to be similar to audience questions because we always research the word a little bit. Um, all uh, the audience questions, um, Jane, have you rename? Could you rename yourself? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jane is renaming herself to audience questions. So when you go into chat, you should see my name and you should see uh, audience questions. Please type your questions into the audience questions because Jane will be siphoning those to me as she goes through to make sure there's not duplication and that they're appropriate. Okay, so we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, Melanie is our fearless timekeeper. Uh, she will be putting up paddles for you all to see as uh, we get started, okay? Uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, and uh, we will start with a 90 second opening statement from each candidate. The candidates have been asked to include why they want to be an alderman <clears throat> and what their qualifications are. <clears throat> and we'll start, <clears throat> sorry, alphabetically uh, <clears throat> with candidate Avarka. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you um, to Melanie and Jane and Believe Women Voters for hosting this. You know, um, I will say that uh, as the daughter of immigrants who actually had to help them uh, learn about candidates and voting from when I was a very small child, uh, this is the kind of thing that I have um, wanted to do since I was a little kid. You know, I was born and raised here in Chicago, and I went to the Chicago Public Schools. And the hard thing about being the first to learn English is that so much of that burden ends up falling on you um, when you have to help your parents, you know, whether that's translating documents or, you know, actually helping them with um, their business applications. And so public service has been at the forefront of what I've been doing since when I was a teenager and I ran for local school council. 
Um, it led to me working for the European Union, Congressman Quigley as his Latino outreach, um, you know, campaigning for now Senator Duckworth, uh, working for Alderman George Cardenas and for the Chicago Department of Public Health. And that eventually led to me becoming a lawyer. And again, a public service is what has been at the core of what I do for my life's work. You know, I focus my pro bono work on immigrant refugees seeking asylum and domestic violence victims. And so really the, the best thing that I can tell you is why I feel I am the most qualified is because serving people is and will always be the foundation of my life's work. You know, this is, um, I do this via collaboration and communication. And my holistic experience means that I am the leader who can bring jobs and resources to the ward and I will do so because I come from you, I am one of you, and I know how to fight for you and what you deserve. Thank you, thank you, Kenneth Ibaka. Okay, um, Kenneth Ramirez, if you could um, take 90 seconds. Amazing. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be a part of now the third forum. And today is the first day of early voting. I hope that now through the third pass that I can win over your vote and you guys can democratically choose who you want to be as alderwoman. My name is Julia Ramirez. I am a social worker, a community organizer. I'm a byproduct of the 12th Ward and running to be your next alderwoman. Uh, my story starts long before me here in the ward. My family moved um, into McKinley Park, Brighton Park 50 years ago. And so I grew, grew up here in Brighton Park. And at an early age, I knew that I wanted to be a community organizer. I started organizing all throughout the city and started getting involved in nonviolence initiatives at a very young age because I seen the ways in which my own brother was subjected to a lot of community violence. My brother was killed in 2014 due to the, the violence in Chicago. And so I've dedicated my work um, as a social worker. I just got my license as a social worker. I've been working for the Chicago Public Schools for the past three years. And the reason why I'm running for older women now is because I know that our communities are tired of political insiders, people with special, special interests who have been selling us out. They've been trading our health and our well-being for corporate dollars. I know that I am the best candidate because I'm going to be working collaboratively and I'm going to be representing all of the people that have been disenfranchised um, through the past aldermen. And so I hope that I can um, win your vote. And if you guys can vote now um, up to February 28th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh, let's get started then. Um, we're going to talk about uh, gun violence and public safety first, and we'll start with uh, candidate Julio Ramirez. Um, <clears throat> so public safety and gun violence are among the top concerns in the ward and throughout Chicago. What realistically could you do as an alder person and member of the city council to reduce gun violence and improve public safety in the short term and in the long term. And please take 60 seconds for that. Yes, um, public safety is my highest priority. Um, your safety is my priority because I know firsthand what it is to lose a loved one. My approach is a very holistic approach. And so what I would want and what I is to make sure that we're allocating the dollars that is fundamentally investing in people. I think ultimately um, what I'm really worried about is that my opponent is going to uphold the things that just have not worked. And so we wanna make sure that when I uh, become older woman that I can expand the One Summer Chicago program. And that means giving jobs and opportunities for young people on a local level. Um, secondly, um, as a person that's worked in nonviolence initiatives, I wanna make sure that we're allocating dollars to intervention workers. I see the ways in which it works firsthand, having people that are um, being um, allocated the resources that they need beforehand, and especially after seeing a traumatic event. And thirdly, working hands in hand with the new ECPS um, elected candidates. I want to make sure that the relationships that I have with CAPS and DCOs is um, broadened with the ECPS because we need to build community trust. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. And uh, next, uh, 60 seconds. Um, Candidate Annabelle Abarca, thank you. Yes, thank you. So, you know, um, public safety has been the number one concern uh, that residents and especially property owners and homeowners here in the 12th Ward have been talking to um, and have said to me for the past few months. Um, but we've seen that and I've seen that firsthand, you know, in attending the CAPS meetings for the better part of nearly 10 years here in the 12th Ward. And so one of the things that I would like to do differently is, you know, take a much more proactive approach when it comes to working with CPD. I think we have a lot of homeowners 
and a lot of residents who really do feel that it is important to see that their uh, police officers are going back and, you know, not doing necessarily leaving the police work to the police where we can, and then moving other resources so that mental health crises that can be responded to by mental health professionals, um, ensuring that teenagers have opportunities um, and making sure that our police officers are actually supported and that we can get them back uh, to walking their beat. So I really do believe in a much more proactive approach. Thank you, wonderful. Um, and uh, a 30 second follow up question. How do you see yourself working with the newly elected council of the 9th police district and its police district commander, as well as with the community commission for public safety and accountability? I do believe the, the 12th ward is a little bit maybe in the um, 8th district as well, but I'm not, no, <laughs> I'm not sure. It's very hard to read those maps, isn't it? <laughs> um, and we start with you, candidate Baca. Yes, thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the first things that I did actually before I was even sworn in is make sure that I reached out to the commanders because the 12th Ward does actually go not only the 9th District, but the 8th District and the 10th District as well. And so having those really important connect uh, relationships with the commanders, but as well as the police district councils and, um, you know, the, the people who serve on them is incredibly important. This is public safety is not one solution. It is is multifaceted who is on this, which is the very first thing that I did um, even before I was sworn in. Thank you. Just with every Candidate Ramirez, same question, 30 seconds. Yes, through my nonviolence work, um, I have worked hand in hand with the CAPS officers and I've actually worked with the DCOs. I was actually part of the new training um, with the DCOs. And so what I want to make sure is that we're spending so much money through the Chicago Police Department, you know, 60% of our budget. And so when we're thinking about these departments that are we're supposed to work hand in hand um, with people on the ground, we want to make sure that they're at the places that we need them the most and that they're servicing the people um, through community trust. Thank you. Okay, we'll start. Um, we'll have two yes or no questions. If you could just raise your hand, um, that would be good. First question: Should the police, uh, should the Chicago Police Department move forward with the Criminal Enterprise Information System, that is the new gang database? Uh, raise your hand if you think they should move forward with that. Raise your hand if you think they should not move forward. Okay, for the record, both candidates are not in favor. Second question, are you in favor of passing the Peace Book Ordinance? The Peace Book Ordinance is a youth-led initiative that will support the development and implementation of youth-led non-carceral and non-policing initiatives for improving community safety and health. Um, are you in favor of the Peace Book? Okay, um, let the record show that both candidates are in favor. Um, and uh, let's move on then to mental health. Okay, let's see. Now I'm keeping track. I believe we are, we are back with candidate Ramirez, I think, for this. Um, the city of Chicago is in the midst of a mental health crisis. Young people have been traumatized by gun violence while untreated citizens live on the street or are often locked up in Cook County Jail. How can the city establish more mental health facilities and services and make sure they are placed where they are needed most? Please take 60 seconds to answer that question. Yes, the data has shown over and over um, where people are being ticketed the most, um, being incarcerated the most. And it's, it's shown that it's actually um, in communities that we've been disinvested in. Um, and so what I wanna make sure is that when we're thinking about mental health, especially as a social worker, I think that there's a huge demand for social workers, but we need to make sure that we're also realizing the sort of 
um, you know, especially for me, like having to go back to school and all the hours that you need to put in. And so is there like a direct pipeline that we're supporting um, more social workers in the field, um, as well as um, making sure that whoever becomes the mayor next, that we reopen our mental health clinics. And I want to make sure that I'm a huge advocate for the mental health clinics to be open in a place like McKinley Park, Brighton Park. Thank you. Okay, Canada Barca. 60 seconds. Yes, thank you. So I think we've seen, you know, the um, repercussions and the consequences of having closed, you know, so many of the mental health clinics and the fact that, you know, citizens and residents of the city of Chicago just aren't able to access those. It is fundamentally unfair that people do not have access to the mental health resources um, that they should have, you know, whether they have the ability to pay for it or not. And we've seen that during COVID that only exacerbated the issues. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that we can work as aldermen to actually dedicate funding sources for this, you know, and that's, it does not have to mean that we end up um, further raising taxes on it, but we can actually allocate, you know, budget streams that we have to be able to provide people with the mental health resources because so much of what um, the issues that we face with are, it's, it's people that have, haven't been treated and they, they deserve to, to be treated. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll stay with uh, Canada Barca. Uh, question about education, a little bit of a preamble before the question. Um, Chicago's 50 aldermen don't have obvious power over city schools. They don't choose who sits on the education board, pick the school's chief, or have any say over closing schools. They don't control budgets, contracts, or any personnel issues. Question, how can you as a concerned alder person still have an impact on the quality and trajectory of schools in your ward? And this will be a 60 second question. Thank you again. You know, you're right in that aldermen don't directly vote on for the budgeting for uh, Chicago public schools. And there's so much that we don't directly control. But again, I go back to my opening and the relationships that I've been able to build, um, whether that was my time as a staffer or working for the Department of Public Health, you know, that is what being an alderwoman is. You are an advocate for not only your students, but for the principals, for the teachers. And that's where these relationships that are so critical because you can advocate on a one-on-one -on -one basis with your state elected officials, with the governor, with even your congressional allies, you know, to ensure that the resources that our students deserve that are being met. I'm a, I'm a product of Chicago Public Schools. I went to a high school that barely had a science lab. That is absolutely unacceptable. But what I can do as alderman is make sure that the state electeds and that the congressional allies are able to dedicate more of those resources to our, to our Chicago public schools. Thank you. Okay. Anna Ramirez. Yeah, when I'm thinking about our local schools, I want to make sure that we uplift our local school council. And so I just had a meet and greet yesterday and I was talking to somebody that's on a local school council and she was just saying that she needed more support in organizing parents and she thinks that there's a lot of power in the LSC. And so I think working on um, strength based assessments on things that already exist and how we uplift those those places, definitely working with the Chicago Teachers Union as well um, and being a strong advocate and um, standing in line with them whenever um, there are needs because there is a really big worry that our local schools here in Brighton Park may be closed down. Um, places like Shields and Burroughs have been told that they will get cuts in various ways. And then, you know, luckily now we will have the elect elected school board. So it's, you know, as an older person, how are we going to make sure that we have, you know, um, families and parents that want to be involved that um, are, are, are a big part of the decision making? Thank you. Okay. And the uh... You both touched on our follow-up question, but I'll ask it anyway, so you can expand if you'd like, uh, starting with uh, Candidate Ramirez for follow-up. Um, how will you work to strengthen local school councils? Um, <laughs> starting, uh, starting in 2024, how will you support and or check the new elected school board? 
Yes. Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that, especially with um, the new ECPS candidates. And I've seen as, as a first time candidate myself, um, the ways in which there are a lot of barriers and there's a lot of like educational people. Um, I mean, educational um, things that you have to inform people on in terms of, you know, being elected or running for a specific office. And so um, that's like a big reason why I'm running, because I feel like people have been disenfranchised and like knowing the processes of things. And so it's definitely educating folks getting people organized, letting people know that they have a voice and um, uplifting the LSCs that exist already, so. Thank you, okay. Canada Barca, uh, same follow-up. Thank you, yeah, I mean, this is exactly where my experience as an actual student local school council member, you know, really does play um, into how I wanna act, how, how I'm going to react as an alderman, you know, Part of what we have to do is make sure that the local school councils are supported, um, but that also that they have access to the other stakeholders and not just necessarily, you know, the principals of their schools, that, that they get the information that they need. And so again, I just I go back to my experience and the relationships and being able to bridge the local school council um, with the other stakeholders. Thank you. And we do have an audience question that is on education. So I'll go ahead and ask that now, uh, starting with Canada Barca. Um, do you support school voucher programs? Why or why not? Oh, sorry. There you go. I mean, fundamentally, I have to let parents decide what's best for them, whether uh, for their children. Um, if they decide that Chicago public schools are best for them, that's what my parents chose. Um, it's the parents' choice. I'm certainly not going to um, remove a choice from uh, from parents. Okay, thank you. Um, Ken Ramirez, 30 seconds. Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree. I've been talking to a lot of families about um, choice in the neighborhood. Um, so what we're seeing is that, you know, um, the, the the Chicago public schools are fun, funded in a very antiquated way. And so um, people are definitely looking at other options. Um, and so we want to make sure that we just make our CPS schools as strong as possible. And so, you know, that that, that our parents want to send our, our students to CPS. Thank you. Okay, um, we will now start we'll, uh, with um, Canada Maris again. And uh, Okay, alders have control over the ward's menu money, discretionary funds that can be used on the ward's needs. The amount is about one and a half million dollars. In addition, they seem to have some influence over how TIF monies are spent. TIF stands for tax increment financing and is collected from homes and businesses in TIF areas. This money can be used to improve infrastructure or provide other incentives to encourage to encourage economic development in the area. Question, how do you plan on spending the ward's menu money and TIF funds? Would you be willing to have meetings with community groups and residents of the ward to discuss setting priorities? And this is a 60 second question. Amazing. Yes. Um, you know, ever since I started knocking doors, I think one of the main things I hear is that people say you're only here just for my vote. And ultimately, when people do vote, they don't really know what the aldermanic office has to offer. And so even, you know, people don't know how to voice the concerns that they have, or what proper solutions the aldermanic office can offer. And so I want to make sure that, you know, if and when we do win, that we do have a participatory budgeting. I think people need to be well informed about the money that's coming in. We need to make sure that it's also a uh, fun in a very equitable way. And so no matter where you live in the ward, that you have true access to the funds and that it's, um, that it's working to the best in the, uh, of, the, uh, of our ability. The other part that I wanna mention is like, even within our meet and greets, um, speaking to people in their homes, people have a lot of infrastructure concerns that are very much the same. And so I think that brings a lot of power instead of people saying, what about my sidewalk or what about my street? And thinking about how it works ultimately um, for everybody around them. Thank you. Canada Barca, uh, 60 seconds. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as far as the, you know, the, the aldermanic menu money goes, you know, I have actually been able to work with the menu money. And so I know how that works as well as the TIF dollars. And while you do have, uh, you can advocate and you can support how some of the TIF funding is out, um, 
you know, distributed that is not necessarily under just like the aldermanic control. But what I would like to do, and what I've actually been in the process of announcing, is creating a um, a participatory budgeting program where our our um, residents, any residents over the age of 14 will be able to not only submit ideas, but they will also be able to actually vote on them. And this would be a year long process with the menu. But what is also really important is making sure that, you know, those of us who have, you know, the ability to understand these processes, make sure to include our neighbors that don't necessarily know how to do that. And part of what I learned as chief of staff is to be able to, you know, reach out to the local stakeholders so that they can contribute as well. Thank you, very good. Okay, we're going to move on to economic uh, development, goods and services. Uh, there are a lot of audience questions that are mixed in with this and I'll, I'll just be asking them after the fact, I'll go ahead and ask what we have here, uh, happened to do with housing. So we'll, we'll have a kind of a, a little schmogers board here, okay? Uh, so we'll start with candidate Barca, and it is a two-part question. The ward has seen and is about to see some major development projects, such as the redevelopment of buildings in the Central Manufacturing District. Please discuss how you plan to support and provide oversight for projects in the ward, part one. Part two, what other projects do you support, especially those which may provide residents with more goods and services? Um, so, you know, first we should clarify that the uh, central manufacturing, the RFPs that have gone out and the three proposals that were received that has not been finalized. And mm -hmm. frankly, it needed to have much more community input. Right now, there's only three people who are actually um, giving their input to that, to those proposals, which is frankly, it's, it's not acceptable because they don't speak for the entire 12th ward. So as aldermen, what I've already um, begun to announce is that we are gonna have a zoning and development council. Uh-oh. And with homeowners, uh -oh. renters, teenagers, seniors, business owners, employees of businesses, um, and they'll be able to actually, you know, put on a community meeting where development will actually be um, presented to them and they will be able the ones who actually, you know, ask questions of the developers. So the entire process is going to be whether or not, you know, the, the community actually wants the development and that's where I'll guide my decisions. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, candidate Ramirez, um, same question. Yeah, I definitely have huge concerns about the manufacturing districts um, because there was um, little to no community input. And I would hate for us to move forward on something that is really going to decide whether or not um, certain people move into the neighborhood. And, you know, frankly, a lot of people are worried about um, you know, being displaced in a place like McKinley Park, Brighton Park. Um, and I, I, so I'm definitely envisioning us having more community zoning processes, more conversations, and hopefully um, we can withdraw um, some of the, other, the ideas that have already been put out and have more community input. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that there is a mad asphalt plant and um, that Alderman Cardenas ended up allowing to be there. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to really idealize a place that um, is constantly being polluted and putting people in danger. Um, and so it's something that um, I feel like is, is putting a lot of what we're trying to envision at risk. And so we want to do everything possible to hold somebody like Matt Asphalt accountable and allow them to move elsewhere. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me keep going because um, we're going to be getting to some of these uh, questions uh, in just a moment. Uh, Let's continue with housing. Uh, so um, some residents, and we'll be starting with you, uh, candidate Romero. Um, some residents have been heavily impacted by gentrification. Furthermore, with economic development, housing becomes more expensive for longtime residents who might not be able to pay higher rents or higher property taxes. Please share your thoughts on how you will increase affordable housing and home, home ownership in the ward. Yeah, the new, okay, thank you so much. Um, the new property tax has affected um, 
families like my own. And so I wanna make sure that we look at that antiquated um, um, assessment um, and making sure that we're protecting homeowners long-term. I'm also somebody that's gonna make sure that I'm going to bat for the most vulnerable, especially our senior citizens who um, wanna make sure that they um, uphold their independent living. And so when we're thinking about new affordable housing units, I wanna make sure that, um, that we grow um, the possibility of having more units in one, having the accessory dwelling units um, within our ward. Um, second, even working on a state level about providing caps and making sure that, um, that rent doesn't get too high to push people out. Um, and third, I really wanna also protect um, the homeless. And so we see many homeless people here in the 12th ward. And so I am um, a supporter of the Bring Chicago Home um, Initiative um, ordinance and um, the real estate transfer tax. Thank you. Alderman Abarca, same question. Um, 60 Thank seconds. you. Um, so, you know, for me, really, I first off, I'm a homeowner and I, you know, own my own my property here in McKinley Park. And so I definitely have seen the in increased property taxes that went on, um, especially as we got our statements in December. So my approach to housing in the 12th Ward is really three-pronged, and part of that is um, backed by my experience working for an affordable housing developer, so I understand what actually attracts developers to the 12th Ward um, and to wards where they want to build and how, how we ensure that they can work with including um, meeting the ARO uh, ordinances. So, that would be first, we have to absolutely expand the pilot program for accessory dwelling units, and that has to be citywide immediately. Second, we have to ensure that housing developers, um, you know, stick to the 20% ARO, ARO. And then third, my other focus would be on the equitable transit oriented development, um, because it cannot be solely home ownership that we focus on. It has to be about our renters as well. Thank you. And let's do a follow up now question from the audience. Um, we had a similar one, but I'm going to ask the audience version. Uh, and we will start with uh, Canada Barca, uh, 30 seconds. In your view, what are the solutions to tackling homelessness and housing insecurity? How will you create solutions in Ward 12? We've both touched on this some, but let's, let's look at it directly. Thank you. So housing insecurity, you know, that's something that, especially when you're um, not only a homeowner, but you're a renter, that it really magnifies the problem. Um, and part of that is ensuring that our residents have access to the resources, you know, whether that be grants from the state, whether that be, you know, um, possible loans from the city or actual grants, um, and making sure that, you know, they have access to capital and to those grant programs from the state so that they can stay in their homes, as well as ensure uh, reducing the property tax burden on the homeowners so that they can stay. Thank you. Um, Hannah Ramir Ramirez, the same question. 30 seconds. Yeah, great. Yeah, I just on it a little bit. Um, the Bring Chicago Home, it would it's the real estate transfer tax on the houses that are um, sold over a million dollars, and that wouldn't affect any of the homes in the 12th Ward. And so we're seeing um, in, in December with the new property tax increases that we're constantly um, looking for avenue streams that are put on the backs of working families. And we really need to change that. And we need more progressive mindsets within city council like myself to make sure that we're pushing um, taxes that are um, taxing the rich and making sure that ultimately that we're housing the homeless. Thank you. And let's do another audience question. It fits into a little bit of what we've been talking about. Um, the question, and we'll do 30 seconds and starting with uh, uh, candidate Ramirez. Um, what will you do to ensure that Damon Silo's riverfront property is developed in line with the community's wishes? Yes, um, the McKinley Park Development Council had reached out to me um, because they had written a letter and they were organizing um, at different capacities, whether it be older people, um, different stakeholders with on the, around the ward. And I did join in on that letter. And so I wrote that I, I did sign my name on my letter and my opponent did not. And so I want to stand, um, you know, side by side with organizers and making sure that at the state level, they make sure that whatever um, they end up if they do end up selling that they do have community input of what the Damon silos looks like. Uh, thank you. Um, Canada Barca, same question. 
Yes, it, thank you. So let's be very clear that the state was in control of the process um, and that they, they're they the ones who failed to include the community in the sale of the Damon silos. But what is, I can control as alderman and what I can ensure is that because it's a PMD and because the PMD process would include a robust community input um, process and whether that's including the riverfront um, access, whether that's in ensuring that the air quality ordinance is applied or whether or not we're ensuring that access to the rest of the riverfront is included, that would be my plan. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, let's just do another little follow-up question here. Um, and I'm going to turn it into a follow-up. It was a yes or no. Um, do you support limiting the control older persons have over zoning in their wards? Uh, this is the aldermanic privilege. And we, we've been all over that. So I, it's a direct question. And I'll rather than yes, no, I'll let you each have 30 seconds to answer that. Starting with Canada DeBarca, thank you. Thank you. You know, as a lawyer, it just, it depends. It's not an either or, and it doesn't have to be an either or situation where either the aldermen have no control or all absolute control. You know, hardline approaches like that just don't work for the community. So I would say that there has to be a community input uh, component of it. There has to be community feedback and robust community feedback. And that's where the decision as an alderman, because ultimately, you know, as, uh, as alderman, you're, uh, you're responsible for and you're accountable to the residents. So we have to take that into account, which is the community feedback. Thank you. Uh, okay, can I add it, Ramirez? Yeah, I think it's yeah, I think it's really important to show up for people um, and, you know, to hold yourself accountable because ultimately, you know, we do have the mad asphalt plant because there was no community say and um, people were able, to, you know, the alderman was actually able to zone uh, for the mad asphalt plan. And so, yeah, it's definitely one thing saying that, you know, it's not one way or the other, but um, I think it really starts about being accountable and, and working collaboratively um, with people. And so that making sure that people are in the know. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we're moving on to uh, questions having to do with environmental issues. Um, it's a two-part question, and uh, we'll be starting with you, Canada Ramirez. Um, <clears throat> the city of Chicago, over a decade ago, dissolved its Department of Environment, leaving a broad range of environmental issues to be dealt with across scattered city departments. Do you support the reestablishment of the Department um, of Environment? Why don't I just do that as a yes or no question? Uh, <laughs> why don't you just each raise your hand? Uh, do you you both uh, agree? Okay, okay. For the record, both candidates uh, feel that feel the, the uh, Department uh, of Environment should be reestablished. Okay. Now, getting on to this question, and we, we're we're still with you, Candidate Ramirez. Um, the question here is, what do you think are the most urgent environmental issues facing the 12th Ward, and how do you plan on addressing them? So that's the question. There's going to be a follow-up, and, and we'll just turn this into a 90-second question because there's been a lot in the, um, in the audience questions. Uh, we'd like you to take into account, um, you know, express your thoughts on uh, Matt Asphalt's place in the ward. So shove it all into one big question uh, rather than having a follow-up. It just didn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, you know, I'm, I, I can't make a promise that we're going to get rid of the mad asphalt on day one, but we're going to do everything possible. I don't think that that has been the case with the former alderman. I don't think that he, he actually was trying to push push CHA to have 100 affordable housing units right next to the asphalt plant because he didn't believe that it really much mattered. And so, you know, number one, we have a pollutant plant in our neighborhood. And so we do need the Department of Environment. We need to hold people accountable and we need to have these parameters to make sure that, you know, ultimately we're looking at environmental racism. It's happening in very specific areas and, you know, it's happening in, in immigrant um, communities. Um, the other part is, you know, aside from clean air, you know, we need clean water. Water. And so we think about the lead, the lead pipes. Um, do we have a clear, distinct plan? And I want to make sure that we have a citywide initiative and that, you know, we're giving people jobs and we're changing um, in order to have clean air, clean water, 
Um, and then, you know, the other part is, you know, the businesses that come into um, our communities, we're seeing trucks all over. I mean, we're literally surrounded by trucks. And so it's just compound pollution. And so we need, you know, an older person that's actually going to be really dedicated on, on moving the, moving forward um, in a green way and, um, you know, in fighting the things that have been established um, from her former boss. Okay, thank you. Hannah Jabarka, same question. Do you need yes, me to repeat you. it or have you got it? <laughs> no, I'm good. Thank you. I thank okay. you. Um, so first and foremost, the reinstating the Department of Environment is not simply allocating, you know, the budget stream for the for that particular department. It's actually taking a really thoughtful approach to how the department would actually, you know, function within the greater. Um, department agencies, and that's not include that does not mean that we should just include more inspectors, right? And uh, whether they're going out to businesses, but it actually includes really assessing how um, inspectors and administrative hearings actually um, hold accountable our pollutants um, and the businesses that pollute uh, into the ward. You know, we all know that uh, the 12th ward has historically been um, an immigrant population that worked for you know, whether that was back of the yards um, packing plants um, or for other um, uh, plants that weren't environmentally friendly. But at the same time, we don't have to do it at the expense of business because ultimately what that does is it takes away jobs. Um, so what we wanna do is ensure that businesses that do come into the ward that are, you know, being held uh, responsible um, and that are doing so in an environmentally friendly way, but also that's ensuring that our state agencies actually work with us. Because really the Matt Asphalt plant was, it was a failure of state agencies. That's all it was. They um, did not take into account the community. They failed to take any kind of um, action, um, whether the community you know, wanted the decision or not. Um, so those are just some of the ideas that are some of the object, projects that I would be implementing. Thank you. And here's a follow-up. Um, you as a legislator. Um, records show that fewer than half of all citations written by Chicago city health inspectors in recent years for air pollution um, end up sticking. Lax enforcement and low penalties have been and continue to be a key part of how polluters escape responsibility for dirtying the air in um, Chicago. As an older person, what can you do to hold polluters in our city uh, truly responsible? And that's a 30 second question. Thank you. So I have direct experience with this as an attorney who actually went before administrative hearings. So as an alderman, I actually understand the process and why they're able to get away with not having to pay those fines. It is because we need administrative, not just judges who understand, you know, the environmental ordinances, but we also need the city law department to have dedicated environmental attorneys who understand the, the impact that these companies are having and that are not going to just non-sue the complaints because their attorney shows up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, candidate Ramirez, please. Can you repeat the question, please? I, I can. I was just thinking you might yeah. read, read it. Yeah, thank you so okay. much. Okay. Uh, records show that fewer than half of all citations written by Chicago city health inspectors in recent years um, for, for air pollution end up sticking. Lax enforcement and low penalties have been and continue to be a key part of how polluters escape responsibility for di dirtying the uh, air in Chicago. As an older person, what can you do to hold polluters in our uh, city truly responsible? Again, 30 seconds. Yeah, um, we, I mean, we've seen it here, right here in the 12th Ward, you know, people have organized and have put in complaints. And um, there's people on the other end that are protecting it. People like older people, um, the mayor herself, um, who won't actually fight alongside, um, you know, holding the polluters accountable. And so I think it's really important that we choose a representative that's gonna be on the inside, um, that's making sure that, you know, even if we have a department is that they're, they're holding accountable um, to the families and making sure that, um, that we set different parameters and that people are, hold, are held to it. Great, thank you. Um, okay, um, a, uh, an audience question. And we'll uh, start with you, uh, Kenneth Ramirez, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, what will you do to combat the rats in our ward? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I get that quite a lot actually um, in Brighton Park. Um, so one of the things that we wanna make sure that we're doing is that um, we're picking up our trash. So a lot of things that I've been hearing is that ultimately people don't get their trash picked up. Um, people were saying that they used to get it picked up maybe even um, twice during the um, during the week. And so we just need to um, advocate for more cleanliness. Um, and then, um, yeah, and I, and I think that that would support um, some of our issues. Thank you. Hannah DeBarca, same question, 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, so I've been on a uh, rodent baiting cruise and I actually know how um, you know, the rat population can actually can be reduced. Um, it's not just about cleaning up is we have to ensure that, uh, you know, we're putting out um, rodent baiting uh, and that's thoroughly through alleys and sometimes even, uh, you know, our yards. But the other thing that we, we can is we need to look at ideas that are not necessarily in the norm and whether that's, you know, expanding feral cat colonies or, um, you know, looking at other uh, rodent baiting that is not necessarily poison. That's how we can reduce the population. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, let's say 45 seconds for this question. Um, Chicago City Council has made some progress towards becoming more transparent and more accountable. Nonetheless, the work is far from finished. How should the City Council bring greater transparency to city government and accountability for ethics violations? Oh, let me unmute you. So first and foremost, the city council absolutely needs to have its own budget office. It also needs to have its own, um, you know, greater oversight under the inspector general, and it has to have a parliamentarian. Um, you know, one of the things that the city council does not do right now is we actually don't fully, uh, you know, choose our own um, council, uh, com our committee chairs. And so those are three of the things that the city council really should be doing because in any, any other legislative body, you know, in this country, they have their own independent budget office. They have their own uh -oh. um, inspector general, they also have their own parliamentarian. Um, really, that's how we're able to work as a legislative body. So what we know that we have, you know, these neutral bodies who we can, we can be accountable to. Thank you. Okay. Canada Ramirez, same question. Yeah, I believe that we need um, better representation and um, transparency. Um, we can do that through the community, the committee chairs that we are elected. Um, so what I'm seeing, especially through the council is that, you know, sometimes um, people are upholding the status quo, upholding certain positions and not working well with one another. Um, and I really wanna change that. I wanna work um, better alongside the aisle and making sure that we also have um, oversight by the inspector general. Thank you. Okay, um, here's another audience question. Um, I think it speaks to the diversity of your ward and it speaks to um, some of the issues that we've brought up having to do with gentrification. The question, and uh, it'll be for you, um, candidate Ramirez to start, uh, and we will give it 30 seconds, is um, what will you do to increase social cohesion without alienating neighbors? Um, so we... Yeah, um, the majority, and I'm ho I hope I'm, I'm understanding it right, um, just talking about people working together in our in our ward. Yeah, increased social cohesion seems to okay, be the, social the, the main uh, uh, phrase there. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, um, we are predominantly Hispanic um, in this ward and we have a growing Asian population. And so something that I'm thinking about um, greatly is about language barriers and language access and making sure that we have in all departments, not just through the aldermanic office, is that everything is truly accessible through language and not, you know, also, also have staff on hand that's culturally competent and culturally sensitive um, to make sure that we're breaking down a lot of these barriers that people just haven't been able to access us um, and building an, a stronger uh, coalition between um, all of our residents. Thank you. Um, uh, Candidate Abarca, did you want me to reread the question or have you got it? No, can you reread it, please? Sure. Um, what will you do to increase social cohesion without alienating neighbors? So one of the best things, honestly, about um, 
having door knocked uh, since August and having and having been alderman. Um, is you see how our community, our 12, the 12 Ward community is so incredibly diverse, but so willing to work with each other and to be neighbors. And one of the ideas that a neighbor actually gave me is to have an identifying, you know, event, an identifying program that the 12th Ward can put on that can actually bring together all of our residents. And that's whether those are Latinos, Chinese, um, you know, that would be one of my one of my uh, projects and ideas. Great, thank you. Um, and one more um, audience question. Um, take thirty seconds for this. Um, should the city of Chicago spend two billion dollars or more of taxpayers' money to dome and renovate Soldier Field as a way to convince the Bears to stay in Chicago instead of moving to Arlington uh, Heights? Oops, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, having been auspiciously born uh, just nine months after the Super Bowl uh, in 85, um, uh, at my heart, I would love for the Bears to stay. However, public funds just should not go um, to that. Uh, it, it would be very unfortunate if the, um, the Bears leave uh, and go to Arlington Heights. But unfortunately, we are in a fiscal situation that is just not realistic for us to be able to dome uh, Soldier Field. Thank you. Canada Maris, same question. Yeah, when we're thinking about all these um, issues that our, um, our constituents are going through, it's really hard for me to imagine using money um, to keep the bears here. I think it's important that we start investing in people and we start reimagining um, our public safety system and taking people, taking care of people in a holistic way. And that's, you know, reopening our mental health clinics, making sure that people um, have um, stability um, in their home and just fully funded schools. Thank you. Um, we You've each touched on the next question a little bit, um, and you can answer it however you would like, but the gist of it is, uh, how will you work uh, with your um, constituents, with the residents? How you will you work with community groups? What kinds of programs will you put in place for communication, for transparency, for setting priorities? Um, it's a catch-all. Awesome. <laughs> yes, I am a organizer. Um, at heart, a community organizer, and I want to bring that experience um, into the office. I think it's really important to meet people where they are at. Fundamentally, like if we um, keep going in the same route in terms of having like the same sort of like ward nights or having, you know, our office open, people are not accessing it because they they don't feel like it's for them. And so I think that we need to do de-root a lot of the ways in which we've disinvested in people and um, educate folks about um, the uh oh. This is now happening to both of you. Um, oh, oh, you're back. Okay. Am I going in and out? Okay. He's frozen a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. That's the lead. Um, we keep everything fair. We, we make sure you both freeze. <laughs> Yeah, I and I just I just wanted to mention that we're already doing that. You know, we we actually have a big staff of volunteers. And whenever I'm I'm talking to somebody and they ask me really engaging questions, I tell them to join in on our campaign. And I think that that's what sets me apart from my opponent is that we're not just talking about these things; like we're actually living them. And um, you know, I showed up to the forum at Kelly High School, and that's already kind of showing that I'm going to show up for people and I'm going to listen and I'm going to be held accountable um, for my residents. Thank you. Uh, candidate Abarca, same question. Yes, thank you. So, you know, part of what makes the 12th Ward um, so diverse is that we just have an incredible age uh, range in our uh, residents, but we also have, you know, um, culturally um, very different groups. And so we really need to keep um, in mind that some of the, th some of the ideas that we've had in the past, they work for certain groups. For example, seniors, they absolutely love ward nights um, and they love their senior coffees, um, but that doesn't necessarily work for some of our Gen, Gen Z where um, they may want to get a text message or they want to do a virtual, you know, online forum. And so being able to just you know, have the capacity to understand that um, different groups will require, you know, different methods of communication is something that, you know, I've already started to do. Um, it's, it's why I started to learn Chinese or Cantonese, 
um, because I know what it's like to go into a government uh, office and know that like, you know, the person doesn't understand my parents and have to translate for them. Um, so, you know, really being flexible, uh, that's how we're gonna be able to reach out to all of our residents. Thank you. Okay, one last question before closing statements. Um, what is, uh, what is one other major issue in the ward we haven't touched on this evening and how do you plan to address it during the next four years? And we'll start with uh, Canada Barca. Thank you. So one of the absolute priorities um, that I am going to work on is um, bicycle infrastructure and how that relates to our economic development. Um, we have seen that uh, the south side of Chicago just does not have the same kind of bicycle infrastructure that the north side does. And frankly, that's unacceptable. And so being able to have um, protected bicycle infrastructure that encompasses the entire ward and even goes into other wards, you know, that leads right to our economic corridors, whether that's 35th Street, um, as done by the, you know, as they incorporated into their vision and their plan, or that's the Archer Avenue uh, corridor um, in the SSA, you know, making sure that people can get to where they're going is really important because if they can't get to their jobs or if they can't get to, um, you know, their neighbors or the grocery store, then they're not gonna be able to have any kind of mobility. So that is definitely gonna be a priority of mine uh, is ensuring that, you know, equitable uh, transit infrastructure is put in place. Thank you. Okay, uh, can it Ramirez, the same question? Okay, awesome. Yeah, I want to make sure um, a couple things that we prioritize also small business um, and build up our business corridors. Um, one of the ways in which people have said that they um, want to build um, their business infrastructure is by having a chamber of commerce. I think people are looking to be leaders and they're looking to build up their network and support one another. And the second part is um, we have a great CTA um, bus lines and um, also a train and making sure as an older person that we are working with um, the Department of Transportation and making sure that um, the, that it's, it's reliable and it's safe um, and, and a safe form of transportation for our residents in the 12th Ward. Thank you. Okay, on to closing statements. You'll each have 90 seconds uh, to make some final statements and we'll be starting with you, Candidate Ramirez. Thank you all for joining um, us on Zoom. Um, I am so happy to continue to share my vision, a vision that includes all of you. I do believe that we can have fully funded schools, we can have mental health clinics, and we can reimagine a, a 12 word that works for all of us. Uh, but we do need a fighter um, within city council, and I know that I can be that fighter. I know for a long time, people have been organizing to have better representation within city council. People want more transparency. People want somebody that's collaborative and that's somebody that's going to show up and make sure that they listen. And I want to be that person that connects the dots for, for people who have felt like they have been um, pushed aside. Um, I know that I am, I am the best candidate because I will make sure that we are safe and thriving in the 12th Ward. I am from here um, and I am all for the 12th Ward. I want to stay here. And I encourage all of you to push everyone. Um, the only way that we can do this is that we get out to vote um, starting today all the way to February 28th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, I just want to thank everybody who came out to the forum and who joined us online. And, you know, my closing statement really will be this. I live in front of McKinley Park and I walk my dogs like many of you. I uh, take the orange line, um, you know, to school and to work just like many of you. I want safe streets. I want uh, reliable public transportation. Um, and I wanna make sure that you know we're working with uh, the elected officials that are around us so that we do this in a way that is not piecemeal, is that we ensure that we're actually getting the resources that we need. And what I can say about myself is that I have been there. I have the experience and I know how to you know, do the job, it's why. Um, when the uh, vacancy happened, I applied for it. You know, I had to ensure that the community, the committee, uh, the appointment committee, they um, interviewed me. It's why I, you know, made sure that uh, my application is public and so is my resume. And I would just ask that, you know, 
we wanna make sure that we are actually getting results done. And that's why my proactive approach is to ensure not just collaboration, um, but actually listening to those of us, to the rest of the, uh, the neighborhoods because so much of what we do involves listening as aldermen. Um, that's, part, that's what I have ingrained in me as not just a public servant, but as an attorney. 90% um, of this job is listening. And I would just say that, you know, I, I'm the best, I'm the best candidate with that experience. Thank you. And that concludes the question and answer portion of our candidates forum. Uh, we want to thank both candidates. You were amazing. Uh, very, very wonderful. We want to thank Melanie, our timekeeper, who <laughs> kept track of everything. Um, it was a wonderful evening. Thank you. And um, we'll now uh, listen to a few uh, comments from our uh, Legal Women Voters Chicago president, uh, Jane Ruby. As soon as I find her, oh yeah, she's got a new name. Hi, everyone. Um, just a final note, you know, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to both of our candidates. Um, a quick reminder that, you know, early voting has started as of today in Ward. Um, so, you know, we you can definitely uh, look up where the early voting site is. Um, voting by, ma by ba mail ballot has also already started. So if you're interested in voting by mail, um, definitely go to the Board of Elections website and request your vote by mail ballot. You can also, in addition to mailing it, turn it in at the early voting site. Um, there will be a drop box there for your ballot. Um, you can also uh, vote on election day, which is February 28th. And um, on that note, there uh, we, we once again posted the websites for both of the candidates. Uh, that spoke today, and you can um, check out their policies further and, you know, reach out to their campaign with any additional questions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and we hope you have a good rest of your night.